Uh, my name is Rachel Arns. I'm on the Nebraska Association of Teachers of Science board, um, and we're super happy to be hosting this amazing um, conversation with everybody across Nebraska. So um, some of the moderators that you'll see in the chat room are Lynn Donahue, who's also one of our board members, and then Anya Covarrubias, who is our president. Um, but we're more excited to introduce our speakers today. Um, Gabriel Tanglau, um, he, he's from New Jersey, and I'm going to actually let him introduce himself. Um, and then we also have Ike Chukwu Onyema, um, who's also going to be introducing himself. So I'll pass the mic on over to you guys. Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Gabriel Tanglau, as Rachel mentioned, a former economics teacher and now work for the New Jersey Education Association in the Professional Development Division. So we're responsible for uh, the local county workshops that are around pedagogy, curriculum development, and other instructional issues, and also our statewide conferences. So just uh, fortunate to be part of this conversation, and I'll hand it off to EK for his uh, introduction. Thank you, Gabe. Um, and Rachel, thank you for introducing me. You said my name 100% correctly there, E.K. Chufonyama. But of course, as you heard, Gabe, feel free to please call me E.K. I'm a chemistry teacher in East Orange, New Jersey for about six and a half years. And as I look in the chat, I see how someone introduced themselves citing some of the demographics of their high school. So I'll just share that my high school is actually practically 100% uh, students of color, uh, about 90% African-American or black and uh, the other 10% is Latino or Latina. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, I do want to kind of explain how this conversation is going to work. So we have some questions we're going to be asking both Gabriel and EK, and they're going to be dialoguing with, with us. What I ask from all of you um, that are listening, if you guys have a question, or even a comment or a resource that you guys would like to share with the group, please put that in the group chat. Um, both Lynn and Anya are going to be paying attention to that. And so if they see a question, they will, they will ask both um, Gabriel and EK that question. So uh, we do wanna make sure your guys' voices are heard throughout this conversation. So um, we, with that being said, I'd love to get into the nitty gritty. So I think, to, I guess, start this off is just ask why. Um, why is it important to talk about equity in the classroom regardless of the subject area? And EK, we can start with you if you don't mind. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel. And that's actually a great, that's a sound like a great place to begin. Why even bother? Um, and I can't help but just get a tad bit personal because I was a student in high school who frankly earned the grades that I needed to earn, uh, did the things I was supposed to do. Uh, and I was frankly taught the curriculum that was supposed to be taught. But I assure you that when I was ready to graduate and pick a profession and decide what to do with the rest of my life, I frankly didn't know where to begin. I had no sense of a mission. I had no sense of a, of a real commitment. Uh, I couldn't think beyond myself. And I think one of the important reasons uh, for bringing up these issues of equity is because, frankly, uh, it gives students a chance to, to view themselves as part of something, something much bigger than themselves. Uh, gives them a reason to actually pursue this thing beyond um, trying to get a decent salary. Um, there are so many real issues that I wish that it, I had been engaged in when I graduated, uh, graduated high school in 2002, uh, shortly after the 9-11 attacks in New York. And I remember not having any kind of historical context. So I think regardless of the subject though, um, dealing with these issues is beneficial for students because it just gives, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember myself as a student and what I wanted and try to be what I didn't have. Um, and it wasn't until college that I really got a chance to start thinking more critically about the world that we live in. And um, I think, why not, why not introduce that earlier? Why not introduce that from the, all of the variety of standpoints that matter, which I'm sure we'll be getting into further on in conversation. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. It definitely allows us to think critically around everything, all the issues that are impacting our students and us on a daily basis. Gabe, what about you? Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, similarly to EK, I would say that part of my experience in K-12 coming up, um, I wanted to kind of frame that around it being uh, a predominantly white community in a suburb in northern New Jersey. And my parents were migrants from the Philippines. And part of that experience and really being interested in history, learning the stories and, and being the type of student that was hungry and curious for more knowledge, um, I felt like there was um, pieces of the history and curriculum that didn't necessarily reflect my own understanding, upbringing, experiences, et cetera. So uh, that was part of it. And it wasn't until later on in life that I started to become more conscious. Um, similarly to EK, I was graduating in a post 9-11 world. So um, my political consciousness and social consciousness grew during my college years. But um, just a couple of things that I learned as a history teacher that I found fascinating about Filipino history that it took me decades to, to find out or discover, um, you know, a fun fact about the role that Filipino farm workers played in the labor movement with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Um, those are some pieces of history of this, um, you know, uh, multiracial, you know, collaboration of one of the most game changing organizing efforts rooted in civil rights that, you know, is a story in US history that's that wasn't included in the curriculum, something that would have been so compelling for me. Um, but that's again, grounded in my own experience. And I can probably rattle off a few more pieces of history that I feel like I've discovered in my adulthood, but did not have uh, those gems as a, as a young person. So um, the one thing that I wanted to name though, is that why wouldn't those gems also be valuable for other students, right? If they're pieces of our history, our collective history, um, that those could be valuable for people to understand the world around them today. So um, I know I'm framing that from a historical lens for science educators, but I imagine we'll explore that intersection as we go on in the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for, for saying that. Gabe, did you say at the beginning that you um, mostly taught white students? Rachel, thank you for that, because I wanted to clarify that in my introduction. So in um, my, the beginning of my teaching career, I was at Bergenfield High School, which was actually one of the more diverse districts in New Jersey. So it was about 40% Latinx, 30% um, white, which included um, many Irish and Italian immigrant families, 20% um, Asian and Pacific Islander. So that included a large Filipino population um, and about 10% uh, black and African-American students also. So that was the beginning part of my teaching career. And I later taught at Bergen County Technical Schools which, which was much less diverse. And it was um, a, a very different experience, which I think will be more perhaps relatable in, in some ways. To yeah, so I guess that bridges me wonderfully into the next question is, you know, Nebraska, there are certain pockets that have more diversity than others. Um, how would you guys, um, I guess, advise white teachers who teach predominantly white students to talk about equity and social justice in their classrooms? Um, and Rachel, do you mean that specific for science classrooms or would you say just in general in their classrooms? Um, I think or we both? can probably both. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, if you have science specific too, we'd love to hear it. Okay. Yeah, no, I'll start from a, from a general vantage point. Uh, so that's a really important question. Why would a white teacher bother to teach about issues of equity and racial injustice to white students for whom this might seem quite distant and almost seem like they have no impact. Like I'm not being negatively impacted by issues of racial injustice. So 
why do I need to learn about it? Well, I think there are several reasons. And I think that the recent protests that have been raging around the country and the world are one example. Uh, I've encountered folks who simply cannot make sense of why folks are reacting uh, with this level of rage and anger. And so I think that if you haven't been exposed to the history of racial injustice, then you're gonna be caught off guard by the actual world that we live in. You're gonna be perplexed by things that are happening around you and you're gonna struggle to make sense out of them. And I can't imagine uh, a worse way to treat somebody than to prepare them or rather to not prepare them for the world that they actually live in. I think that is ultimately what we're tasked to do as educators. Um, but more specifically though, and um, this point may even be controversial, but um, I think it's important to at least raise it. And that is to say that if racial injustice is an issue, um, then that injustice is being per perpetrated by someone or some group. And as important as it is for African-Americans and all of the other groups that are marginalized and disenfranchised by systems and histories of, of oppression and marginalization, it's also important for the groups who are benefiting or privileged by these same systems to also be aware of it if we actually want it to stop. Because <laughs> we have to deal with the culprits, for lack of a better word. Um, if I'm a victim of someone's mistreatment, I need help, I need healing, that needs to be dealt with. But the crime, in order for it to stop, um, it has to be dealt with uh, by those who are benefiting from it. Um, it's, it's very easy, I think, sometimes to dismiss the role that those who played who came before us, uh, of those who played who came before us, and think, well, I didn't do anything wrong, so, you know, stop bringing this up all the time. But um, I think if we're being honest, uh, if you're continuing to benefit from these legacies, you know, economically, socially, um, health-wise, you know, when we start talking about the intersections, um, then we have to call attention to that. So those are just uh, two quick reasons why it's important. I think that's so powerful to say, especially because we know that a lot of our curriculum doesn't always tell the whole story. And that can make it easy for students to just kind of push things aside or not fully understand how um, it impacts a lot of other cultures and marginalizes them. So Gabe, we'd love to hear your, your insight on this as well. Yeah, so I, I think back again to when I was a student and I remember thinking that the 21st century was going to be the future, like this futuristic, different world. And, um, you know, here we are, right? It's 2020 um, and thinking about the global context, thinking about the shifts in the, the larger, you know, international scene, the, the different cultural shifts, the waves of um, various movements um, across the globe. And just that global consciousness is something that I think is, is an aspirational goal that I had as a teacher in terms of bringing that into the classroom, but also bringing students consciousness and uh, awareness to, to a global level, right? So, um, E.K. and I have partnered on a workshop before that's focused on thinking global, acting local, right? So in what ways do we have an awareness on a broader level, um, in part because that will help raise up young people to be more uh, broad thinking. And even, you know, we frame it in the national context around citizenry, but how do we have global citizens that are engaging in this technological era, right? Where the world is shrinking in the ways that uh, we can, prior to COVID, travel, um, in this case, communicate, and what kind of literacy does that create too? So the global literacy piece, how am I engaging with folks from other cultures outside of my local space is something that um, I think is essential as a skill set for the future, for the present actually, and the future of uh, young folks. So if that's if that's part of our aspiration as educators, then that's the framing that we need to enter into this space. So similar to what EK was saying about 
uh, making sure that our students have the ability to understand and analyze the world around them, you know, placing in that larger context is, is essential. And I'll further say that as uh, a person who's not uh, a science teacher, science is essential to that. I, I'm aware that the role that science educators play in helping uh, provide the skill sets and the ability to analyze and understand the world around them is critical. So um, for that reason, I think this is, this is super relevant and, and very much connected for science educators. And you, we have a question um, from the participants. You mentioned like the lack of students getting exposure to some pieces of our history. Do you guys know or have you been exposed to texts or materials that are better at sharing all of those pieces of our history or more information? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try that question um, first. <laughs> I know, that's pretty specific. <laughs> Uh, um, in terms of books, I think there are plenty of books. Uh, I don't think that you'll find one book that does it all. Um, I'm thinking, however, of a book right now called uh, Body and Soul. Its uh, subtitle is The Black Panther Party and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination. It's written by a professor at Columbia University. Her name is Alondra, Dr. Alondra Nelson. That's one book, it's, I don't know how well known it is, but I'll tell you, when we think about the intersections of the fight for racial justice and science, if someone would have told me that the Black Panther Party stood, uh, stood firmly at that intersection, I would have been lost as to how. But the fact of the matter is that uh, they took it upon themselves to set up clinics uh, to deal with the disparities uh, related particularly to sickle cell anemia, but others as well. Uh, certainly their breakfast programs, the nutrition aspects, dealing with you know nutrition gaps that are still uh, in existence today. Okay, I see someone just put it in the chat. Um, that's a book for me that really just, it, it, was, it was revolutionary for me. I didn't, I didn't know, or I didn't think to conceive of the application of science in the community through that way. Um, another book that I would recommend, and again, I'm, I'm citing books that are at the intersection of this uh, fight against social injustice and science. Um, there are plenty of books though, that from a range of perspectives. So I'm just being very particular for the sake of this conversation. But there's another book called What the Eyes Don't See uh, by Mona Anna Aisha, she's a, uh, I'm sorry, Atisha. Uh, she was a pediatrician in Flint, Michigan when the uh, lead water crisis was unfolding. And she documents uh, the before, during, and after uh, so vividly. Um, in fact, I'd probably recommend that book just a little bit more than the other one. Uh, again, um, looking at how science stands at the intersection of, uh, of fighting for racial injustice, I think that we risk when we divorce, you know, this fight for racial and because it's so prevalent and it's always happening. Uh, but when we divorce our students and the science curriculum from that, we deprive our students of a chance of really developing their own sense of a collective mission for what to do with themselves and viewing science as a way to carry that out and achieve it. Um, oftentimes, you know, the humanities is really where this might happen or it's most likely to happen. But uh, I think the sciences are obviously just as important when we think about health disparities, you know, pollution disparities, uh, just differences in birth rates uh, that are racial, that are just, I mean, talk about Black Lives Mattering. Well, I mean, there are babies that simply won't be born purely because of racism it has nothing to do with abortions or anything else, no matter where you stand on that. Uh, simply being black means some of your babies will not even be born. Um, think about the technology divides that were amplified by the coronavirus crisis. I'm also of Nigerian descent, as you can tell by my unique name. Um, and in Nigeria, you know, the electricity gaps that are happening there are just are just wild, especially in such an oil rich country. And frankly, Africa being a resource rich continent, uh, yet and still the disparities are just glaring in, in your face. Um, how does one make sense of all that? You know, like why did, 
why did I have to migrate or why did my family have to migrate to this country in the first place, uh, given all that we have back home? I mean, all of these conversations, I think, have to be part of a meaningful and a rich and a comprehensive curriculum. And, uh, and those are two books. Uh, there are plenty more, um, but you know, I'll give Gabe a chance to respond as well. Yeah, EK, I would, um, I would offer, and I'm dropping the link in the chat, but A People's History of the United States is by Howard Zinn, is one of the supplementary texts that I used to use in a US history course. But the reason that I think it's perhaps um, an essential read that it helps tell the story of history from the lens of those who were conquered in the broader narrative of what, how history is generally told, right? Um, but I'm actually gonna reframe that because that's a deficit language and deficit thinking. Uh, it begins with the story of folks who were indigenous populations in the United States and across North America and the Caribbean. Um, the story of Columbus is chapter one uh, but, you know, in what ways, and I'd just be fascinated to be part of an actual conversation with you all to see what are the pieces that you pull that are relevant to uh, the science curriculum. One of the things that seems very prevalent is COVID-19 and the global pandemic. Um, it'd be fascinating to even take a look at that first chapter, uh, the impact that European colonization had on indigenous populations with regards to diseases and how that affected the immune system and decimated a population as part of, you know, this um, colonial uh, takeover of land. So that's just one example from the first chapter. I, I can only imagine that there's many more rich examples that you all with the expertise could, could pull from that. Uh, the reason that I would offer that as well is there's uh, a supplementary text that is called a young, uh, it's a young people's history of the United States. So it's actually a reader that could be targeted or shared with uh, students. So you can navigate both the, the text itself for you um, and then the reader for, for, um, for students. So that's just, again, one example. But I imagine if, if you really had this intersecting conversation, you can dig up so many more possibilities for lessons that um, cut to the heart of equity related issues, but intersect with social science and science. Yes, thank you so much uh, for those answers, guys. Um, I, it brings me back to this um, conversation that we had right when we uh, were logging on about the importance of globalizing your curriculum, as you guys were saying. And I wanted to share this opportunity because I, this is actually what connects me Gabriel, EK, we've all had the opportunity to participate in the National Educators Association, their Global Learning Fellowship. And so I encourage all of you guys in the chat room um, to take on that opportunity. You get to learn abroad. Um, I believe all three of us had the opportunity to go to South Africa. And so learning about how to incorporate the ideas of um, social justice and empathy, compassion into your curriculum. So whether you are social studies, science, or even an art teacher, and you work collectively with a group of teachers around the nation, I think it's a very powerful experience. So that's going to bring me to my next question for um, both, you, both you guys. Um, what do you guys say to teachers who are scared to bring up conversations around equity and race when they feel like they don't know the correct language or they might inadvertently say the wrong thing or they don't understand all of the microaggressions out there? How would you encourage or um, advise a teacher to navigate that? Yeah, um, I'll start up, but I loved your transition to this question, Rachel, and I can't help but just uh, do my best to, to highlight a shirt that I got while I was in South Africa. And this has all of the different, uh, just the different popular places in South Africa. Um, and you also said something about the importance of teaching with empathy uh, and incorporating that into our curriculum. And I just must share that uh, one of the most amazing blessings of my career as a teacher 
occurred not during this school year, but the prior school year when I had a student teacher uh, from nearby Rutgers University, the Newark campus. Uh, one student who was uh, studying to become a chemistry teacher, uh, unfortunate rarity, most folks who decide to major in chemistry have ambitions to go into, you know, maybe the health field or the private sector. Um, you just won't find that many that are simultaneously majoring in chemistry and education. Uh, just it was just such a dear experience for me that I'll frankly never forget. She made me a better teacher, absolutely. And um, social justice was one of the core tenets. And I am going to come to your question, by the way, I promise. But one of the core tenets of the program at the Urban Ed program at Rutgers is social justice. And so I remember Fridays, you know, we're getting ready, making our plans for the next week. And then the question pops up, all right, how are we going to, you know, integrate social justice into next week's lesson? And I'd be like, um, let's see, covalent bonding, not going to happen. And she's like, no, 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 I have to. It's, it's my assignment. I have to, <laughs> we have to figure this out. So we just be there, you know, spitballing ideas and we, and we figure it out though. We would figure it out. And I just want to give one example of one of the ways that we figured it out. And it's not always cute and pretty, but I just had to share that. Uh, so uh, for some of the science folks, at least, you know, a covalent bond has to do with, uh, two atoms that are sharing electrons. That's the most basic way to put it right. Uh, now that sharing isn't always gonna be equal or get you to polarity. Uh, and so a, just a more general question, we tried to step back and engage the students who could probably care less about polarity. And we just said, you know, um, the question we asked was, should societies force people to share their wealth and resources with others in order to create stability? Because, you know, a covalent bond is happening ultimately for stability. In the molecule. So we were asking that though from a much larger societal vantage point and we, it was able to uh, become an awesome debate. Uh, we had students kind of standing along a continuum from agree to strongly disagree, strongly agree to strongly disagree and defending their positions and moving along that continuum. And this is before we even introduced the concept of covalent bonding, but just to get them thinking about issues of empathy, issues of equity, and you triggered that for me when you transitioned to this question, so I had to share it because there is room in the science curriculum for all of these things. And I think that does lead me to the question you asked for those teachers who are scared. Uh, I don't know, there's, um, in that particular example, I didn't know what the students would say. Uh, I had some students who were all about, no, you know, let the rich folk keep their money and let the poor folks be poor because it's their fault in the first place. I mean, all kinds of ideologies that I didn't agree with, but I allowed other students to fill in the gaps and I didn't want to necessarily nudge or push. I asked critical questions, but ultimately where they landed was on them. But just creating the opportunity for that discourse was so was so vital. So the to the teachers who, who may be afraid, um, I'm one of them actually, <laughs> who, gets, who gets afraid sometimes about doing this kind of work. I mean, I, I teach in an urban area that I've already told you is uh, an urban area predominantly uh, non-white students, and there are plenty of issues that I would love for us to just get out and tackle. And I'm, I don't always do that, but, uh, you know, start somewhere, start somewhere. I'm not where I want to be yet, I assure you, but start somewhere. And also I would just say, uh, squad up, you know, get a squad, get a, there are other like-minded teachers, um, hopefully they're in your science department, but if they're not, all the better, go outside the science department. Gabe and I collaborate all the time, uh, in spite of our different disciplines. I think that's the actual model. Um, and frankly, like I said, the humanities, they've been taking up this mantle for, for much longer than we have. So we have a lot to learn and we can humble ourselves and ask those questions. Oftentimes I do detect a bit of arrogance, quite frankly, from those who are science focused, you know, and it's like, you've got something to learn from everybody. So squat up uh, with teachers inside your building and outside your building who are doing this work, who are committed to it and just figure out small ways to get started. You'll be surprised at where you end up before you know it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll let Gabe share a bit. Thanks, EK. As I, as I transition, since you shared the shirt, I'm also representing um, a shout out to Zaire, even though we went to South Africa. Uh, Muhammad Ali is one of my favorite boxers and representing. Anyway, um, so in terms of ways to lean in, and I think one of the things we need to acknowledge and what I appreciate from EK's response is that we're all on this race consciousness journey 
at different levels. Um, we started at different points. Our systems aren't designed in a way that um, really help scaffold us to go along that journey. And a lot of it is the uh, moment that either thrusts us into it for some folks, um, the curiosity that leads us toward, towards it naturally. Um, and then there's sometimes life-changing events, but I wanna name that for some folks, particularly people of color, we don't have the privilege to let that be a choice. So um, it's, it's not a choice for us to, to have um, either be race conscious or not. That said, the way it shows up in the classroom and the way we show up in the classroom is something that I agree, it, it takes a level of, you have to summon a little level of uh, courage. And I think that is grown from the community of people that you surround yourself with when you squat up for sure. But to, to offer something more tangible, um, I actually wanted to lift up just two resources. One is from one of our, talking about squatting up, one of our, or two of our comrades out in Washington state, uh, two educators, white male educators who um, are aspiring anti-racist educators. And they use that term aspiring because they understand it's an ongoing journey. They did uh, a 10 video, primer series for white educators interested in becoming um, more anti-racist oriented. And it's a really great quick way to um, prepare yourself for that journey. So I shared that in the chat. I won't um, contextualize it too much, but just offer that, that that journey begins with curiosity. And hopefully this is a, this is a, a trail of breadcrumbs that can lead some folks along uh, through their own race consciousness journey, specifically in how it impacts the classroom. The other piece that I wanted to lift up and I'm dropping it in the chat, it's, um, it's actually an amazing story from two young ladies from Princeton, New Jersey, that in their sophomore year of high school, after hearing some news that's related to, um, to racial tensions and racial violence, they actually became curious uh, about understanding race in a more intentional way. And they went into their community started interviewing people about their experience with their race journey um, and realized that there's something to the storytelling aspect of it. They went on to collect more stories. They actually took their first year of college off to travel the country to be able to interview more people and compiled it into this textbook around racial literacy. And I feel like often when we talk about racial justice and racial equity, we're really focused on the on the um, advocacy pieces, but as educators, racial literacy creates that scaffolding understanding of how to become more conscious, self-conscious, uh, model that for other students to be able to go along their journeys, and also creates entry points through storytelling and empathy as, um, as EK was sharing earlier. So those are just two possible resources worth exploring that I want to lift up in the space. Thank you so much for providing those resources, Gabriel, because I do know, I mean, and I can empathize. I know, EK, you said that you get scared talking about it. I, I get scared talking about it um, because sometimes, like, I'm not always aware of the microaggressions that I, as a white educator, might be imposing upon my students. And so I think it's definitely um, always important to learn, to listen, and to have those conversations because without them, you can't grow either. So um, I loved the comment that I saw in the chat room um, from Sharina. Sharina, you brought up that you had an angry parent call you because you had um, pride and trans flags in your classroom. So I would love to ask our speakers um, a question related to that actually. Some of our students' parents may have grown up with deeply embedded biases and or may have also been on the receiving end of racism. So how can we help mend those situations among our students and their families and work together to move forward with more understanding, knowledge, and compassion towards others who are different than us? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, my students' parents, it's funny, I have a slightly different challenge in my school building with parental engagement. They, they care for sure. 
Um, but to be honest with you, there's not that much I would do in the classroom that I think would kind of cause their ire. Uh, it just happens to do with the particular context in which I teach. Um, yet and still, um, those biases can range from indeed conversations about sexuality, um, but even frankly biases around just in general, which is similar, what should be taught in a science class. So if I'm here having conversations and debates about any topic at all, as opposed to just kind of moving or pushing through the curriculum, um, I can imagine that frankly teachers and frankly more important, my administrators will will give me an issue you know why aren't you focused on covering more content in the classroom um, yet the importance of your question still stands we have a responsibility to teach students first um, I, yes i'm a chemistry teacher but i teach students first i teach them before i can teach the content so you know if i really do have the care and the empathy that you cited earlier then exposing them to people who are different, um, anything that's different is part of my responsibility. And I think that uh, this is where I think she was fortunate, I saw that comment as well, that her administrators backed her up. But uh, this is also another important place for unions to play a role as well in defending folks in the right moments. Um, and, you know, when we go back to your earlier question about teachers who have just fears about the microaggressions and what they can look like. Um, I just wanted to cite again, if you are squatting up with a diverse array of teachers um, and you're running your ideas by other teachers, teachers of color, African-American teachers, et cetera, um, they can give you some insights where, hey, wait, no, that idea that you're proposing right now to teach this um, isn't gonna work and, and try a slightly different way. Uh, we've had exist, uh, situations locally where teachers in an attempt to teach histories of slavery have actually carried out, for example, slave auctions, which only revisited the trauma on the students who were the original victims in the first place. It was like, did you run this by anybody? You know, I think this could have been avoided by the simple act of listening. So uh, that could have saved their professional experiences. Um, and if we're not exposing students to people who are different than them, I mean, there's nothing that we can accomplish in this world that's worth doing by ourselves. Uh, we ought to get used to it now, working with folks of different backgrounds, different sexual orientations, et cetera, if we actually have the ambition to accomplish anything worth doing. Now, if your only mission is to, I guess, I don't know, <laughs> make money or something a bit more shallow, shall we say, then perhaps you can do that individually. But if you actually want to make the kinds of differences and changes we want to see in the world, you got to get used to it fast. You know, how do you work with others? What are the benefits of working with, with folks who are different? Um, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount, uh, partly from the uncomfortable experiences of working with folks who are different. Um, I couldn't have had those moments of growth if I were not around them. And that has prepared me, I hope to be uh, someone who can affect change more effectively now. Yeah, that, I just had to leave some space because that last point was just so powerful. It's, it's the community, it's the, we're talking about squads, we're talking about community, we're talking about collectivism. And part of it is if as an individual educator, you're wading into these waters around equity and perhaps they're, they're dangerous waters for you for whatever reason, um, then part of it is, you know, building that team, building a movement of folks who are um, also addressing it in a collective way. So, uh, but I wanted to back up because I felt like the question had two aspects to it. So I actually wanted to lift up that this conversation around equity, as I entered the conversation, I was thinking about racial equity and racial equity being at the center. So the conversation around LGBTQ plus um, rights being a part of that conversation, I just wanted to thank the person that, that raised that as part of the conversation with equity. And I'm actually going to drop a link in the chat that's defining a term that uh, is coined by Dr. Kimberlay Crenshaw called intersectionality. And this is a just short clip of Kimberlay Crenshaw describing what that means. 
but really it's about how does inequity and equity issues intersect, whether it's racial equity, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, and, and how those identities are, um, have different ways of connecting. Again, not my place to necessarily fully articulate it in this space, which is why I just dropped the link and um, encourage folks to just take a closer look at that. Um, but to circle back to the point, I wanted to share a story. My cousin who lives in the county where I used to uh, teach, where I grew up, uh, Bergen County, is wrestling with some issues around something that seems trivial perhaps to some that they the school board in one of the districts recently decided to change their mascot from the indians to another mascot now uh part of that in my immediate response was well yes that's uh, a small step to make sure you're addressing how that stereotyping is emotionally violent to indigenous people right so that's my immediate response and my cousin went on to tell me that uh, there was actually so much rage around them changing that that mascot that there were um, parents and some students that were uh, starting to lobby the school board expressing their anger around that now um, being aware that we're in a moment of heightened awareness. And of course, depending on the community, that pushback can look uh, many different ways. Um, parents indeed uh, are able to flex their ability to um, put pressure on situations. And when it's coming from the angle that it's not supporting equity within the schools and classrooms, that can certainly be something that um, would deter people from leaning into those spaces and having the safe space to do that. But again, just going back to EK's point, it really is not an individual pursuit, but rather a communal collective pursuit. And um, I think that's an important point that I just wanted to leave in the space. Thank you guys. And I definitely resonate with the idea of our, our students come to our classrooms with so many more identities than just their race. And so how can we make our curriculum culturally responsive? Um, so that way we do hit upon a lot of their other intersecting identities and we'll feel they feel represented in the curriculum. So that actually goes towards my next question. And then Kristen, I saw you also asked in the in the chat room, is there curriculum that can be used um, during an advisement period. And I'm also just going to broaden it to like what kind of curriculum can we see in a science classroom that is culturally responsive um, and also looks at uh, maybe social injustices and while still integrating the, the science content. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be sitting in my mini library here at my house. Because as soon as I heard you begin to ask that question, I just turned around and I looked for this one here. Uh, Rethinking Schools is a fantastic organization. I'm not sure if you can read that, but it says it's a people's curriculum for the earth. Um, it's just a great resource of all kinds of ideas about ways to address this um, in ways that, you know, teaching about toxins is just something that just popped up here. Um, teaching about a toxic world, food farming and the earth. Um, I like the first chapter, the whole thing is connected. Um, the, you know, Rethinking Schools does a fantastic job with all kinds of curriculum, but this might be, if someone's looking for a direct resource, this is one for sure, but there's plenty. There's, I think there's plenty out there, but I'll just share that one. EK, that's exactly the organization I was gonna cite, Rethinking Schools, um, and I dropped the link in there for the curriculum text that you were sharing and also just generally the magazine uh, has a lot of great articles, um, you know, written by educators from across the country. It's rooted in a social justice perspective, but then they do have a wide range of topics that um, focus on different subject areas. So just going to reaffirm that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think also if I can just jump back in on that question, um, you know, besides a, 
a, a curriculum that's already prepared for us. Uh, you know, we live in a, in a world that is ever changing, right? I don't know if there's like a COVID-19 curriculum that's been written yet, I uh, highly doubt it, um, but that, that, that becomes our task. So as important as it is to identify models that we can use to get, the, get started on the journey, um, it's equally as important, I think, to really get the skills to organize spaces uh, to work with other educators to do the kind of curriculum questioning and the cu curriculum building and the curriculum revisiting uh, over time because that's ultimately what's going to sustain us. Um, these these ready to go curriculum and rethinking schools is different in that uh, they don't just publish one thing and call it a day. They actually have an ongoing magazine and they're constantly revising. They just updated a previous book, uh, the new teacher book that Gabe and I contributed to. But um, but again, I think it's I think a better qu question, if I may say, is uh, how do we equip teachers with the skills to build learning communities? Um, I think once we once we tackle that, uh, we can get above the fear and the anxiety, and um, I don't want to say excuses, <laughs> but uh, just the, the challenges, the the things we all say sometimes that uh, just slow us down and get in our way, and um, and I must shout out my friend Gabe as well, though, for, for the, the risks that we've taken in developing and cultivating these kinds of professional learning spaces and communities, um, particular skills that we've built, um, particular protocols that we've practiced how to use in space with other teachers. And I really think that equipping teachers with that skill set, I mean, you know, to shorten that phrase, I might say teacher leadership skills. Uh, is, is, is really what we need so that we can seize the political initiative. I mean, right now, if you want to do something social justice oriented, I mean, look at all the companies that are claiming that Black Lives Matter. You know, some of these are patent lies, but they're making these claims. So, you know, if they can do that, certainly we can, we, we who mean it should be able to do it in our classrooms. Um, so we, we got we to gotta close that skills gap so that the fears can uh, be mitigated. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I definitely think it's a culture that needs to be fostered within a school setting and collectively, it, you're, you're going to have a stronger voice. Um, there's another, so we, Gabriel, Gabriel and EK and I have talked about this before. I think there's some natural ways too that educators can build in social justice into the curriculum, whether that's through service learning or uh, we've talked about youth participatory action research which is similar to service learning, except the students are a little bit more engaged in each parts of those research processes, identifying the issue in their specific community, finding ways to tackle it um, and collecting data, and then also being part of publication. I do think that you know, we can give students those opportunities to identify as scientists and be part of that research journey. Um, there is some really cool, and I can put them in the chat room, um, uh, publication opportunities for students where they might make a video and then publish that video through New York Times or PBS and getting their voices heard about science issues within their communities, whether it's lead or um, food deserts, um, but really elevates their voices and um, let them know that they're being heard. So yes, I thank you guys so much for that. Um, one of my last questions for you guys, uh, with all of this being said, um, teaching students of color, teaching white students, is there any takeaways? Like if you just needed to give like a, some small piece of advice to someone who's brand new to this or you want your teachers in this room to be able to spread this message what would that be i was muted sorry i'm back okay 
Uh, thank you so much for that question, Rachel. Um, but before I answer it, if that is the last question, just want to thank everybody, though, for taking some time out to listen to us talk about our experiences. Um, I'm seeing a total of 23 participants on a Friday afternoon. So clearly the Nebraska educators are committed. I'm looking at the chat. It's super vibrant. I'm seeing, I'm, frankly, I'm learning here, if I'm just going to be frank with you. I'm looking at all of these amazing resources. I hope that this can be saved and shared out at the end because there's some tremendous links that have been populated in this chat. So thank you guys. I'm really humbled by the opportunity just to share my, my small perspective over here. Um, if I had to give uh, a piece of advice to teachers about doing this work and the courage that it takes to do it, um, hmm. well, it would really be to just do it. And now is the time, uh, you know, if you, now is the time, now is the time, now is the time more than ever. It's a very urgent issue. Uh, because people are dying. Uh, people are dying in the streets for this. Uh, the least that we can do with our privilege, with our, with our degrees, with our certifications, is to put something on the line and to risk something. Um, certainly, in the midst of this coronavirus crisis, um, many have been rendered unemployed. Uh, many have been rendered poor and been impacted economically. Um, I feel super fortunate to have been able to continue to, to be employed, to be able to continue teaching uh, in the midst of this pandemic from the relative safety of my nice little cute office here while others were risking their lives. Um, so for me, the question is, what am I risking? Um, folks are in the streets, as I already alluded to earlier. What am I risking? Um, what, do you, what do I have to lose here? Um, I'm not risking nearly as much as others do on a regular basis. Uh, this is so important. Uh, there's uh, one of my favorite authors, if I have to throw another book before we close this conversation, would be uh, Dr. Bettina Love. She's written a book called We Want to Do More Than Survive. Um, she talks about this concept of spirit murder. So certainly there are folks in the streets decrying the, the murder of bodies by police, but spirit murder, some could argue is a little worse. If a student is walking into your classroom and they leave with a sense of inferiority. They leave with a sense that uh, they come from a community or people that haven't accomplished much. much. Uh, they're spending eight hours in a place where the concepts that they are learning are totally divorced from their reality. Uh, that, that's spirit murder. And the consequences of that uh, probably go a lot further than the murder of bodies because it gets translated across generations uh, this is a collective kind of thing. It's happening to collectives of people and it renders them to lives that aren't nearly as rewarding and enriching as they could be. Uh, so frankly, let us not be guilty of the spirit murder. Uh, if we're going to say Black Lives Matter, if we're going to say that police violence needs to end, uh, let's take a look at ourselves, take a look at our profession and be honest about the other kinds of murders that we are uh, in fact perpetuating at times. And I include myself in that. Uh, that would be what I call stu uh, teachers, my fellow teachers to remember. It's such a deep and powerful call to action, really. And I think the thing that I would add to that is just don't let the pursuit of perfection get in the way of progress, right? Don't think that there's an exact right way to approach all of these things, it, although it's, it's, it's a learning journey, right? It's um, going to be challenging. You're going to make mistakes. Certainly check in with folks. Always reflect and debrief as you take steps forward to try to do the self-work first and then enter the classroom as a model in, in those ways. Um, so don't let perfection get in the way of progress. I would say um, stay connected, again, in that spirit of community. Uh, you know, looking here on this, again, Friday afternoon, this could perhaps be the beginning of a new community of folks who continue these conversations beyond this initial point. And I think that's, um, that's one of the beautiful parts of, of collaboration and, you know, um, taking a stand, even being present for this conversation is, is, is an action in the, in the right direction. So, um, you know, just act with the level of urgency that we're seeing now. Um, and 
give yourself some grace, right? That's, that's the other thing too. Um, I, I, along the way, have made so many mistakes that have helped me grow. And that's actually something that is a beautiful thing to embrace. Um, as long as you're always conscious and intentional to be aware of the ways that you can impact the people around you, especially the students um, with regards to, um, you know, the, the trauma and other things that folks experience. So uh, those are just some, some minor thoughts before we go to the final close. And just, again, also expressing gratitude to you all um, and humble thanks to be able to collaborate with EK in this space and with you all and, um, and Rachel, thank you so much for inviting us. Yes, can I, can I jump back in? I'm sorry, I saw a question in the chat from Allison, I believe, about how, how does she as a teacher respond to statements of racism in the classroom? She says, obviously statements of hate are not tolerated, but statements the students do not know are a statement of racism. How would you address these statements without creating a debate? Um, I, uh, I think that's a very valid, important question. Um, I can only imagine the students who, um, you know, you're going to have a group of students who are probably going to intentionally make racist comments or comments that they know are offensive, but there will also be comments that are made that students don't quite know are offensive, and certainly from a standpoint of racism, but even in my classroom, uh, we talked about sexuality earlier. That's, our, that's also a very real thing. Um, that, it's a tough question to address because it's almost like, you know, how does it come up? If it's coming up in writing, is it coming up as a side comment? Is it coming up in the presence of a discussion where there's time to address it? Um, is it something that you address in the moment or is it something that you try to address later on or afterward? Um, it's hard to give one answer to that question because it's just, it's, it, 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 it can be read in so many different ways. I certainly have had students who say inappropriate things that I've dealt with in a variety of ways. There's some that I may stop the class indeed and just deal with if I feel that I can or if it's appropriate, but it's not always and I would acknowledge that. So um, I'm unable to give like a direct answer to that, but I definitely wanted to lift up that question because it's a very real question and it probably will happen and probably already already has happened in our lives lifetimes but i just wanted to lift that up because i saw it at the end but there's not that much time left so i'll stop yeah, it, ek i'm just gonna also piggyback off of that because you lifted it up i think um being reactive and preemptive are two different approaches in thinking about the classroom especially as you enter the summer and thinking ahead the community agreements that you can uh, co-develop with students on the front end and naming some of these things up front about and having a discussion around what is appropriate and appropriate, et cetera, and let it that be co-created as community agreements throughout your throughout your school year um, can create an environment where it's not just you as the educator that are holding students accountable, but you create an environment where there's self-accountability. So just a brief um, peace. Excellent point. Thank you so much for saying that in the chat room, EK. I think those were really great answers. And I do want to thank the both of you guys for taking the time out, sharing this space with us, um, traveling virtually to Nebraska to help us out. Um, your guys' advice and responses and were super thoughtful and they were truly a gift to us. So we really appreciate everything you, you've done for us. So um, I'm like we said, we're going to record this and we're going to save the chat room. So if anybody wants to reach back out, um, please feel free. I'm going to stay on a little bit longer. So if anyone has any further questions or um, need wants to further chat, please again, feel free. Other than that, thank you again to our our listeners for, for coming in and growing with us today. Thank you, Rachel. You were an awesome moderator, by the way. This is, uh, this is great. Absolutely. 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 Learn from the best. <laughs> I felt totally comfortable. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs>